okay, asshole. Let. Don't. And you, you're wrong. Those who look with clouded eyes see nothing but shadows. Everything about you is wrong. All born are bound to her. Should this world be unmade, so too shall her children. The world won't end today. But you... You will. Listen. Destiny comes. We drag our asses all this way. This is the welcome we get. <sighs> boy, oh boy. So freedom is steep. Embrace your dreams, and whatever happens, protect your honor as a soldier! Come and get it! This is the point of no return. Destiny's Crossroads. Then why did you stop me? I'm not really sure. What will we find on the other side? Freedom. Boundless. Terrifying freedom. Like a great, never-ending sky. What you heard just now were the voices of the planet. 
Those born into this world, who lived and who died, who returned, are howling in pain. Because of him, Sephiroth? They... their words... they don't reach him. All these months and memories, precious and fleeting, they're like rain rolling off his back. And when they're gone, he won't cry or shout or anything. He'd tell you that he only cares about the planet, that he'd do everything in his power to protect and preserve it. But this isn't the way it's supposed to be. There's no greater threat to the planet than him. Sephiroth has to be stopped. He has to be. And that's why... I'm asking you to help me. I know that together we can do this. But if we do... We'll be changing more than fate itself. If we succeed, if we win, we'll be changing ourselves. I guess... Maybe... That's why I hesitated. You said it yourself. He has to be stopped. And frankly, I've heard enough howling for a lifetime. There is a um, lot to unpack there. I'm going to have to wait for the fight to start to really talk about it, though. But we're finally sort of seeing the confirmation of what we've been suspecting up until this point about the nature of the ghosts Thank and everything you, like that. Cloud, we should go. So if we go through that thing, there's no coming back. Is it our destiny to defy destiny? It's an interesting question. Ready? Never tried to challenge destiny. This could well be her last line of defense. It won't be easy. Let's go. spit in destiny's eye whether you can see the scenes or you can't doesn't change that she's always trying to have it her way daddy's coming home real soon honey about you, but it looks normal to me. Okay, that ain't right! 
see me? Wouldn't go that far. So that then, that's a whisper too, huh? Looks a lot more like an arbiter of fate than the others. We can beat them. So, 14 minutes into this episode, I can finally say something, really. Now, the entire game, we've been seeing these sort of deviations from the storyline of the original game. And a lot of them are just minor things or fleshing out characters like the other members of Avalanche, giving them more character, explaining more of their backstory, all that kind of stuff. And that's, that's not really what I'm talking about here. What was happening, though... Oftentimes, the story would very specifically like deviate away from the way that the original game story played out. Things like Cloud not being hired to go on the second bombing mission, or Cloud fighting and attempting to kill Reno, that kind of thing. Something where it would have dragged the progression of the story or the plot points away from the original game. Well... These ghosts would always appear, or would oftentimes appear, and do something to try and sort of drag the story back in the direction of the original version of the game, the original story. And you saw this, for example, when Cloud didn't get hired for the second bombing mission. The ghosts appeared to injure Jesse. With Jesse injured, they had no choice but to hire Cloud to bring him along. Of course, that's a deviation of the story itself, because Jesse did, in fact, go on the second bombing mission. But I think it was more important that Cloud go than Jesse, so I guess that explains that. But the further and further we got into the game, the more and more these ghosts seem to have appeared. Getting, I guess they're getting more and more desperate to prevent the story from changing. And what their motivation is, or why they're doing, or where they came from, or what their purpose is, what their ultimate purpose is, I don't know. We don't really have that information yet. We have to wait for the sequels to come out. But the further we got into the story, the more effort they seem to be putting in. And now we've reached the kind of precipice. And it seems like Aerith is talking about it like, this is the final like the decision we have to make. Do we step forward? and fight Sephiroth. Or not. If you step through that cloud and you fight Sephiroth, then that is a change in history or a change in fate and change in destiny that is just enormous and it will change everything. So, they do that or not. Well, they step through the board. They step through the fog. Run, damn it, run! Well, now these ghost things seem like they're putting in, like, their final effort into preventing the story from changing too drastically. Because... Like, more or less, whether the ghosts succeed or not in preventing the story from changing, they, um, it's always been something minor, and the storyline has largely progressed the way it was going to anyway. But if Sephiroth dies now, and Aerith is convinced that Sephiroth is the ultimate threat, of course he is, but if Sephiroth dies now, then that is the ultimate change. You can't come back from that. That's too big of a change, so the ghosts are trying to do everything they can to prevent that from happening. So that brings up another thing to think about, and that's what Aerith's, uh, Aerith's motivation for all of that is. Now, I'm getting the impression that she has some awareness of the way that uh, fate has veered off of its intended course. I don't know if she's consciously 
really all that aware of it, although she does make some references like knowing that Cloud was a mercenary. And that speech that we just that have, like, talking about Sephiroth, she really didn't know who Sephiroth was until she was told in the original game. How does she know that he's the ultimate threat, that he's the one that needs to be destroyed? She seems to have some knowledge of the original story progression and all that kind of stuff. So I'm guessing she knows that she's eventually going to die. I guess that she knows that Sephiroth's plan is to sort of absorb the energies of the planet to become something of a god and continue his mother's um, genocidal trip through all of existence. And that's what she, like, okay, like, Sephiroth needs to be destroyed, and that's, this has got to be the end of it. Like, we need to end this now. But, you know... She, yeah, you know what, she also mentioned a couple other things, like the whole, when Sector 7, the plate, was going to be destroyed. She seemed to have had some advanced knowledge of what was going to happen. So, I don't know how. Maybe it's something to do with her being an ancient that she's aware of these changes. Sephiroth, on the other hand, seems to be aware of the changes as well, which is why he's made an earlier appearance and why he seems to be sort of manipulating events and manipulating Cloud to do things. I mean, he manipulated Cloud a lot in the original game. That's kind of like a major point in the story. But he seems to be aware of things. Now, I don't know if Sephiroth himself is responsible for this deviation in the story, or if he's just sort of there trying to take advantage of it. I mean, it's possible that he is making the changes. Like, all said and done, even though Aerith was killed in the original game, everything worked out in the end. Sephiroth was destroyed, and the planet was saved, and all that kind of stuff. So, you'd think, like, Aerith, I'm sure, doesn't want to die. She didn't intend to die when she did what she did in the original game, but... I'm sure if she knew, she safely could be assured that the planet would be saved, she'd be willing to sacrifice herself. So she wouldn't want to change history just for the risk of potentially saving her own life. But she seemed, maybe she's aware that Sephiroth is planning on changing things. He's changing history so things don't work out the same way. And that's why she seems so obsessed with stopping Sephiroth now. Sephiroth is changing the rules, he's changing the game, and we need to stop it now, or it gets out of hand. That's my interpretation at the moment, anyway. Bring it, fuck on me! Bring it? Did we do it? Hang on! Uh, Eric! Just see. A glimpse of tomorrow if we fail here today. saw a vision of the future. Now, they've clearly misinterpreted it. That scene that we saw of Red 13 running through the desert was clearly intended to be a sort of a remake of the scene shot from the very end, the post credit scene of, of Red 13 and in, I'm guessing his children or something, or descendants or grandchildren, who the hell knows, who cares? running along in the desert, and then they come across a destroyed Midgar. On one hand, that showed a very um, 
maybe disturbing perspective that humanity didn't survive, but on the other hand, it does show that the planet survived. But they, uh, Red seems to have interpreted that as being a vision of what happens if they fail. Well, like, I don't know, maybe... Maybe it is an interpretation of what happens if they fail, because clearly, if the story progressed originally the way it did, and then it changed to be what we're seeing here, then that was something of a failure. But I think maybe they're just misinterpreting, or he misinterpreted what that was. Because it did kind of show a ruined Midgar, and it did show a, a world where potentially humanity didn't really exist anymore. I don't know. It's, it's just all sorts of speculation going on right now. The battles in this game, I have to say, one thing I, I wish they maybe did was make the boss battles a little harder, but a little shorter. I didn't really have much difficulty running through this game, but I would say that the boss battles did drag on for quite a while. And it sort of reminded me a lot of the boss battles that happened in Final Fantasy XII. Where, especially the end boss battle, where the boss seemed to just stretch on forever. But it never killed me. I've never died to that boss, at least as much as I can rem far as I can remember. Like, there were a couple of times where I died while playing this game. But it was mostly for me being stupid and not taking it seriously. But this game isn't difficult. It's actually easier, I think, than the original Final Fantasy VII. Without any experience, I managed to get through it. But, uh... It does take a while to fight these things. What are you shooting at, Barrett? same time. In that case, Ultra Big Boy is all mine. Bring it on, bitch. Cloud really just say, bring it on, bitch. <laughs> okay, so we're seeing more um, uh, foreshadowing or flash forwards to events that occur later. The meteor that had been busted up by the rocket approaching uh, the planet, Gaia or whatever it's called, and like that can't be our future. And everybody is starting to see these things. It's not just Aerith that has some. Maybe this is how she perceives the future, how she perceives the other timeline, and. You know, they don't have the context of what had happened. They don't have the context of knowing that they, if everything played out the way it should, the meteor should be destroyed, that Severoth would be killed. I'm discounting Advent Children. I don't want to talk about that fucking movie. <laughs> well, is that Bahamut? Yes, it is. <laughs> the Whispers. I've been calling these things ghosts the entire time, which kind of confuses the issue because there are, like, ghost enemies in the game. So, it's... Hmm. Unable to read. Oh, a coalescence of these things. Uh, Tifa's got a limit break. Why aren't I using it? I recorded this gameplay, like, a year ago. And it's taken my ass forever to post these episodes. So I don't know what I was thinking when I went through anything. Like why Tifa has a limit break but I'm not using it. There we go. No, use a summon instead. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. What, why am I sniffing through the menus? 
Anyway, I thought about ending this series with this one episode, but the episode would be like a hundred, uh, an hour and a half long or something like that. So, figure it's better off. The ending is pretty long, plus the credits. Better to split it off into two episodes. This is, in fact, not the final boss, although it kind of comes across as one. Kind of funny, the original Final Fantasy VII had a kind of an end boss that wasn't really the end boss. So you had uh, the fight with Genova, and Tifa's down. Tifa's down, lost her limit break. What the hell's wrong with me? You had the boss with G the fight with Genova at the end of the Northern Cave. And then you had Bizarro Sephiroth's fight, which I thought was a little disappointing when I first saw it. Then you had the safer Sephiroth, the One-Winged Angel battle, which is the true final battle of the game. But there is one more fight that occurs after that, and that's the fight against the Dream Sephiroth, which is a scripted battle, and, like, it's impossible to lose. Like, I've tried losing that fight. I can't figure out how to do it. <laughs> Jeez, Tifa. Vicious damage. Plus, you staggered it, too. Amazing. <laughs> Sometimes limit breaks just do brutal, have brutal effects in this game. <laughs> yeah, better give it to Tifa or Aerith. They're about to go down. No sense in saving Mega Potions. You're clearly at the, at the end of the fight. It's one of the things, like, apparently I'm not the only person who does this, but I have this sort of habit of hoarding my higher power items, my mega potions, my elixirs, uh, turbo ethers, that kind of shit. Because, like, they're rather rare in the game, and I consider them to so be so valuable that it's not worth using. Not worth using for a fight that may not be uh, difficult enough to warrant it. So I end up ending the game without... <laughs> Like, holding on to them, and then the end of the game comes, and I still have them, then use them. It's like, what the hell was I saving them for if they didn't do me any good? Uh, but, you know, I think I understood this is the last of the fight. This fucking fight isn't over yet? <sighs> okay. <laughs> Whatever, it still makes sense to use the uh, Mega Potions. This game actually had me a little screwed up with uh, thinking about the progressions of of the game and all of that kind of stuff. Look, look at that, that limit break just did so much damage. Was that cross slash there? Because this game, like, I, I had an understanding of the original game's storyline. And this game stretched out everything in the beginning. Um, just, we're in the Midgar sections of the first disc of the first game. That's what this remake, the first... Uh, game in the remake series just covers the Midgar section of the original game, which was really like a 10 hour or less section of the game. So, as I'm playing through, I, in the back of my mind, I had this idea that. Oh, is this a cutscene? Well, anyway, I had this um, incorrect perspective about where I was. I mean, I understood that the game was stretching out the Midgar sections of the game. But subconsciously, I was thinking about everything like I was still in the beginning of the game. So when it came to gathering materia, when it came to um, weapons and all that kind of stuff, I made decisions that I probably wouldn't have if I realized... Well, if I subconsciously realized that I would say like 50% of the way through the game, like um, upgrading weapons and all that kind of shit, or buying materia, like I would, I would never bought any materia in terms that I never really needed to, but I didn't want to. Um, I don't. I'm, I'm not. I'm not wording this very well. But it just, the point was, though, that since 
I had this weird subconscious perspective that I was much earlier in the game than I actually was. I was playing the game like I was much earlier in the game. <laughs> that I wish I could come up with an example, but it's been so long that I'm kind of confusing myself. Plus, I haven't slept for for 19 hours, and uh, my caffeine isn't working, and I gotta get something to eat after I finish recording this. And, you know... <laughs> Making excuses. That's all I'm good for anymore. Excuses. That little, um, scene there, that was the scene of Aerith's death. I wonder how that would affect... I always wondered what... I mean, not speaking about terminally ill people, which, uh, I mean, they can oftentimes see their, their demise coming a long way off. But what would happen to a healthy person who understood the idea that they were going to die at a certain point, or... Perhaps, I mean, those people can come to understand something. They can come and have closure for their their death. But um, seems like it might end up sort of being a worse situation for the friends or the family, or the loved ones of somebody who knows that they're going to die. Like if Aerith knows that she's going to die, she can come to accept that. But how would somebody like Cloud come to accept the knowledge that Aerith is going to die or, or even Tifa or Barrett or any of the other characters knowing that she was, that what they were doing was going to end up killing her? That theme was explored in Final Fantasy X. Go play that game. <laughs> Yuna. Yuna knew she was going to die, and all the other characters knew it, and they it was a painful thing, and they didn't want to talk about it. But Titus, the main character, didn't know. And Yuna didn't want to tell him because she knew it would hurt him. <laughs> 